right, if you have your Bibles this morning, I would invite you to turn to Matthew 24. We're going to be looking in Matthew 24, 36 to 25, 13. This is going to be a compilation of about four mini-sermons. So get ready. So I don't have a main point, but I have a title. The title of today's sermon is Awake, Ready, Faithful, and Wise. And Lord willing, this will be the most woke sermon you hear at SSBC. The last two weeks in the first half of 24, we've seen Jesus predict the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. And we know, looking back historically, that Jesus was right, that that generation did not pass away until the things that Jesus prophesied took place. But in verse 36, Jesus changes his focus. If you'll remember back in Chapter 24, verse 3, the disciples asked him a couple of different questions. And Jesus has answered the first part in 1 to 35. And now he seems to be shifting to the second part in verse 36. So our focus this morning will shift with Jesus. Turning from his prediction concerning Jerusalem and the final death of the old covenant... And then in turn, look to his second advent, his second coming. And this is the period in which we as Christians find ourselves in, between the first coming of Christ and his second coming. The first coming when he came as a gentle, vulnerable baby. And his second coming, which we look forward to, in which he will come as the conquering king. Jesus seems to have turned his attention to this, and part of the evidence is that in that first 35 verses, Jesus gave some pretty specific instructions, gave some telltale signs that they ought to be looking forward to. But in 36, he becomes much more general, much more vague. And in this latter section, Jesus confesses ignorance. Jesus seems to understand the specific timing of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, but whenever it comes to his second coming, he tells us that he does not even know that day. So let's first consider the ignorance of Jesus. Look in verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. It might be a little surprising to us to read this verse, a little startling as it were. Jesus confesses ignorance to the timing of that day. And he tells his disciples that this information is reserved for the Father only. Could it be that the Son of God really did not have knowledge that the Father possessed? Well, in some sense, yes. As Christians, we believe that Jesus is truly the eternal Son of God who has existed with the Father from eternity past. The Father, Son, and Spirit were ever present before the beginning and enjoyed perfect communion with one another. This means that they shared the same nature, but they also shared the same knowledge. Yet here we see, and we have seen throughout Matthew... That in the incarnation, at Christmas, the Son of God takes on human flesh. Without relinquishing any of his divine nature, remaining ever God, Jesus takes on a fully human nature. At Christmas, the Spirit adds humanity to Christ's deity. God becomes a man. And he truly was a man. He wasn't a visible spirit. He was an embodied person just like you and I are. He was carried in the womb as we are. He was born as we are. He grew as we do. He was tempted as we are and dies as we ought to have. But it also means that Jesus learned as we do. One of the clearest statements on this reality comes from the book of Luke. Luke chapter 2 verse 52 And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. 
Now, to be sure, there is a mystery here between the relationship of the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ. But instead of getting caught up in the weeds, I would suggest that we take the Hebrews' approach to our understanding. Hebrews, throughout its testimony, clearly states these two realities. And it sees them not as warring contradictions, but as dear friends. Just listen to a couple of verses here. Hebrews 1.3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. You can't get any more God than that. In Hebrews 5.8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. You can't get any more human than that. Therefore, it ought to be clear to us that in the incarnation, Jesus willingly veils his divinity for the sake of identifying with us. So in this way, when Jesus confesses his ignorance as to the timing of his own return, it's an evidence of love for you. See, Jesus willingly takes on our weakness, including our lack of knowledge, so that he could walk life as we do. He does this for you. And while Jesus will turn his attention to judgment here in a second, and at the end of things, he'll show that he is the judge of the living and the dead, he does so in order to provide a loving warning to each of us. So as we walk through this passage, which is chock full of judgment and exclusionary language, we might be tempted to think that Jesus is harsh, but quite the contrary. This passage is an evidence of the love and compassion of Jesus. Enough to tell the truth about the dangers posed to those who do not actively look for the Son. Jesus, in his kindness, warns us of his own severe judgment. See, we see here that love is not affirmation. Love tells the truth. So let's turn our attention now to 37 to 44, where we see we will be surprised by judgment. 37. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So Jesus begins to illustrate what his second coming will be like. And the first series lets us know that it will be a surprise. He compares it to the day leading up to the flood in Noah's day. The people around Noah were going about their normal everyday lives, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in to marriage. Now, as normal as this may seem, this description of the activity of the people in Noah's day, we know from Genesis that the people around Noah were so wicked that that is what prompted the judgment of the flood. And so Jesus is not saying here that their activity and their behavior was innocuous. What he means is that they were just acting as they normally did. In other words, the flood, God's judgment, was not an imminent reality for them. And therefore they saw no apparent need to change their posture to God. This is in spite of the testimony and warning of Noah. We don't have time to turn there, but Hebrew tells us that Noah condemned the world by his obedience. That his activity in building the ark was condemnation to the world because it was a sign that judgment is coming. And the ark was, in essence, a, a giant billboard, a public service announcement. Judgment is coming, prepare yourselves. 
that the world did not listen to him. And thus, only eight were saved on the ark. Jesus says, so it will be with the Son of Man. Or in this manner will the Son of Man come. See, Jesus, in his life, death, burial, and resurrection, is yet another sign, is yet yet another conspicuous announcement that judgment is real. Except now, the people of God do not find refuge in a boat, but in Christ. Well, then he gives another parable with the same point. He compares his coming to a situation in which two men are in the field or two women are at the mill. In both instances, one is taken and one is left. Now, just through a cursory reading, we might assume that this passage is speaking about some sort of pre-tribulational rapture, but that doesn't seem to fit the context. Jesus is saying and says explicitly, therefore be ready because you do not know the day or the hour. The one taken away in both of these instances, seems to be taken away, not in rescue, but in judgment. This is why he speaks of, in verse 39, of those in Noah's day being swept away by the flood, being taken away in judgment in a moment's notice. You can imagine the man out in the field with his head down, unaware of the danger that lies on the horizon above him. So why must our eyes be up? Why must we be prepared? Jesus says, verse 42, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. And lastly, he compares this to a homeowner who, if he would have been tipped off to the coming of a burglar, how many of us would enjoy that? Hey, you're going to be burglarized at 3 p.m. or at 3 a.m. That would be really nice. Jesus says, yeah, that would be nice. If he did know that, he would have been prepared. But it never works that way. The burglars don't send you a letter saying, hey, be ready, I'm going to come at this time. A save the date, as it were. You must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in a similar fashion. Coming at a time you do not know, but at a time you also would not expect. Notice the thief comes when he expects the homeowner to be asleep. At this point, through these first few verses, is the point clear enough for us yet? When the Lord comes to judge the world, it will be a surprise. So the first application we ought to take away from this is to reject any speculation as to the dating of the return of Christ. I submit to you that if Jesus did not know the date, and then says you will not know the date, and tells us that you will not expect it, then we can have no evidence that anyone can calculate the return of Christ. So be cautious of any teacher who would tell you they have discovered or been given revelation as to the precise dating of Christ's return. It seems to me that if Jesus was right about the destruction of Jerusalem, then we can trust him to be right about this issue as well. So be careful of false teachers who come and tell us Christ will return on this date. For Jesus tells us explicitly, you do not know the date. And Jesus closes this section with his own application. He says, because you do not know, be ready. See, the posture of the Christ follower is clear. Expectant vigilance. Jesus will explain what this does and doesn't look like in our next two sections. But the point of it is, we ought to be actively looking for and maintaining a state of readiness. Because we do not know the date or the hour. Christ will return when we least expect him to. So, he compares this in many situations, as we'll see, to falling asleep. And when we're asleep, unaware of the imminent return of Christ, meaning that Christ will return soon, then we can find ourselves in danger of two ditches. A la Rascal Flats, life is a highway. Don't fall asleep at the wheel because you will end up in one of two ditches. The first ditch is the ditch of false belief, that the delay of Christ gives us a license to sin. Look in verse 45 to 51. Who then 
is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and an hour he does not know. He will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus first talks about this positive side. Who is the one that responds properly to the absence of his master? Who is the faithful and wise whom his father has set over his household? This ought to be the question that we ask ourselves on a regular basis. Is this indicative of who we are, being faithful and wise in the midst of this inter-advental period? Between the comings of Christ, are we being faithful and wise? And it's clear that Jesus intends his followers to be about his business. His followers are set as caretakers over his household. And who is the faithful and wise one? Well, it is the one who expects his master to return and wants to care well for his household when he does. See, we've seen in several times throughout Matthew how Christ relates blessedness to his people. That those who are about his master's business will be the recipient of blessing. We see this actualized in verse 47, right? So this servant is doing what his master calls him when he comes, and so he's blessed. And what does the master do? Verse 47, truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. This is so important, Jesus will repeat it again in Matthew 25, verse 21. Look there briefly. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. See, this is not the prosperity gospel. As though if you do things for God, that God will then heap material blessings upon you. No, Jesus is talking in an eternal time scale. In some form or fashion, glorious beyond our, imag- our imaginations, Jesus will reward those who are faithful to him in this life giving them jurisdiction over things in the new heavens and the new earth. And so, his encouragement to his followers, be faithful, be wise. What you've entrusted with now will be indicative of the things that you're entrusted with then. And up to this point, this makes intuitive sense, right? You're given a job, you do it well, and there's a reward for a job well done. However, The primary concern that Jesus seems to have here is the inverse situation. So Jesus adds this part, this positive aspect in the middle, but it's sandwiched between all this warning of if we take his word lightly. So what is the conduct of the servant who takes the delay of his master as a license to sin? Because this second servant, he has the same authority as the previous, Yet his posture towards his master is totally opposite. He takes his master's authority, he takes his master's possessions, and he abuses it for his own sake. He sets himself above his fellow servants and presumably uses his master's wealth for his own pleasure and satisfaction. Yet in both cases, the master returns. Only this time, it's not to bless the servant, but it's to punish him. And notice here the continued theme of surprise. Jesus wants to make abundantly clear to us, you cannot plan on the return of Christ. You have to be ready for it at all times. And this was the fault. This was to the fault of the second servant. The wicked servant does not believe the word of his master. And so what happens? His master punishes him. And this is what the fool does, right? The fool says in his heart, there is no God. The fool says in his heart that he will not give an account for God, for, to God for deeds done in the body. The fool says in his heart that there is no judgment. So 
So I have a question for you this morning. Is this indicative of you? And I think that maybe the the greatest way to realize this, because sometimes we're bad at looking at these things on such a broad scale. But what about simply in the eyes of man? Do you abuse the time that you think no one is watching? Have you fallen into sin because you thought that no one was looking and no one would find out? Is there sin that you need to confess because you are using a lack of accountability as a license to sin? This isn't just for adults. This is for kids and students too. Kids, have your parents given you freedom, maybe time at home by yourself for a period of time? Are you abusing that time? When you're out of sight of authority, are you a different person than when you're in the sight of authority? Do you use a lack of accountability as a license for sin? See, I think if we see evidence of this on a small scale in our lives, then it's indicative of the greater scale. Because the reality of Christ's judgment ought to be a sobering thought to all of us. It's meant to hone our focus. It's meant to remind us that we live all of life before the face of God. So let the reminder that Christ will return as judge sober you up to your sin. And remind you that Christ will judge you for it. And this is accented by the extreme language that Jesus himself employs. This is why I mentioned the love of Jesus at the beginning. Because we can read verse 51 and find Jesus to be quite harsh. Verse 51, for for when he returns to judge the servant, what will happen? He will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, in the first half of Matthew 24, Jesus makes a claim that he has all authority. He is the son of man who is presented before the ancient of days and given dominion over all things. This means that Any authority possessed by man comes from Christ. You, all your possessions, all your authority, all your influence is Christ. It belongs to him. And you will give an account to him personally for how you used it. It is his to use for his good pleasure. Now, he is kind He calls us to be stewards over the things that are his. Yet this king does not deal gently with those that misuse what is his. Christ will return to deal with the wicked servant who abuses what belongs to him. And he will do this with swiftness and severity. The wicked servant is cut into pieces and placed with the hypocrites where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. We saw Jesus use this language back in chapter 8. It's meant to illustrate that the eternal destiny of the wicked is not annihilation. It is anguish. Do not take lightly the reality of hell. Hell is not the home of Satan. Hell belongs to God, and it is the place of torment for all who are not found in Christ. It is the place where sinners are exposed to the glory of God, to their horror. So let us be warned of using the delay of Christ's return as a license to sin, of presuming upon his grace. But let us also not be unprepared for it, ignorant of it. Let's look in verses 1 to 13 of chapter 25. And look what it means to be shut out by unpreparedness. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. Five of them were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come and meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. 
But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Jesus gives another parable, and it illustrates a second ditch that we are prone to fall into. The first is a license to sin. The second is the ditch of unpreparedness. We have ten virgins, or bridesmaids. It was traditional in Jewish culture to have a wedding party like this. And Jesus divides these ten bridesmaids into two groups, the foolish and the wise. The wise take oil with them, and the foolish do not. And at the delay of the bridegroom, they all fall asleep and are suddenly awakened at the announcement of his return. The wise, having extra oil, were able to light their torches or their lamps and go, but the foolish could not. So they asked the wise, can you spare any oil? And they said, well, if we gave you oil, there's not enough for you as well. So go and buy some at the market. So the foolish, they detour to the market. They buy more. By the time they get to the house, the door is shut and the bridegroom rejects their entry and says, I do not know you. Now again, Jesus' point is the same. Be watchful for the return of Christ. The point of this parable is not about the length of the bridegroom's delay, but it shows us that there's a preparedness that we have to have. In some sense, I think we can more easily understand the previous parable, right? Well, of course, the wicked servant is judged. Of course, because he's beating other people, because he's going out and getting drunk and abusing his master's resources, of course, he is judged for his sin. But from our vantage point, it seems like these bridesmaids are almost innocents, right? They're just a touch foolish. They just didn't bring enough oil. They just didn't prepare themselves enough. How could they be kept out of the wedding for something so simple? But consider the point that Jesus is making and why Matthew would have these parables in succession here. The point is that neither the wicked servant nor the foolish bridemaids discharge the duty they were given. As bridesmaids, their job is to accompany the bridegroom to the wedding, to be about the procession that leads to the culmination of the wedding ceremony. And as fools, they did not prepare themselves for what was coming, and they were caught unaware. In the sobering language we've heard before on the Sermon on the Mount, it pops up again. Lord, Lord, open to us. Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do miracles in your name? Weren't we a part of your entourage? Weren't we a part of your wedding party? Depart from me. I never knew you. See, these bridesmaids did not prepare themselves. They did not have what was necessary at the return of Christ. They were not ready for it. So maybe this morning you don't consider yourself antagonistic to Christ as though you're the wicked servant. But maybe you're just ambivalent to him. Maybe you're just lukewarm. Maybe you just think Christ is some sort of cultural phenomenon. The only way to be prepared for the return of Christ is to trust in Christ. The only way to be prepared for his return as judge is to trust in him as your Lord and Savior. You may not consider yourself an enemy of Christ, but are you a friend of Christ? Notice that both the enemies and the ignorant of Christ are left out of the kingdom. See, we see here two sinful responses to the return. Either a willful rejection of his imminent judgment, but maybe even more dangerous, especially in a place like Abilene, Texas, is a functional ignorance of Christ's return and judgment. How great a travesty to consider yourself to be a part of the wedding party 
only to discover that the bridegroom does not know you. Be warned. It is not only those who are outwardly wicked who will face the wrath of the king. It is also the fool who does not personally prepare for his coming. Therefore, consider this morning if you are that fool. And become wise. Become wise by trusting in Christ. Have you submitted to Christ as your Lord? And are you bearing fruit and keeping with repentance as a sign of your assurance that you belong to this Jesus? Just to state it again plainly, it is both the willful rebel and the ignorant fool who will be kept out of the kingdom. So what is the application? What does it look like to respond to all of these loving warnings of Jesus? We must stay awake. See, in some sense, the mystery around the second coming of Christ is actually meant to be a grace to us, as odd as it may seem. See, if we examine ourselves for any length of time, I'm sure that we can see ourselves as tempted to put off pertinent things until the last moment, right? How many of you didn't study to the, for the test until the night before? How many of you submit your taxes on April 14th? How many of you pack the day of your leaving for vacation? How many of you men buy flowers for your wife on her birthday instead of the day before her birthday? See, I think the Lord has kept us from the knowledge of his second coming so that we won't take it lightly. So that we won't put off what is necessary until that day. See, he has told us that it will be a surprise, and therefore, we must be awake and prepared at all times. And as we read the rest of the New Testament, we realize that his followers took this very seriously. For them, the return of Christ was an imminent reality, and it shaped all of their activity. It shaped all of their boldness and zeal to see the gospel go to the nations. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. There's many other passages that I could take you to, but this is just one example of how Paul took Christ's warning seriously and called the Thessalonians to do the same. Look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're just going to read a couple of verses here. Look at chapter 5, verse 2. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. See, Jesus has already used this same illustration. Paul is picking up on it. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Skip down to verse 6. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. So what does it mean to stay awake? What does it mean to be ready? What does it mean to be faithful? What does it mean to be wise? Well, since Blake's not here, I'm going to give you eight ways that you can remain awake and sober-minded as we wait on the return of our Lord. Now, each of these is pulled from the rest of what Paul's doing in 1 Thessalonians 5, so I draw your attention to that so that if you want to go and meditate on these things later, by all means. So these are pulled from that, but we're just going to go through these briefly. So what does it mean to be awake? Number one, it means fear God. Your judge is God. There's a common phrase in our culture today, only God can judge me. Friend, that's not a source of comfort. Your judge is God, and his judgment of you is sure. So heed the words of Jesus, that he will return. The Proverbs tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So the wise person is the one who recognizes that God is their judge and submits to him accordingly. So let wisdom, fear of God, rule your life. Believe that Christ will return as your judge. Therefore, believe him. 
trust him and obey him. This is what it means to be awake. A phrase that I found myself using regularly recently is that there is no refuge from Christ. There is only refuge in Christ. So fear God. Take refuge in his son. Number two, despise sin. Fear God and despise sin. So if you fear God, you're going to hate your sin. So hate it with every fiber of your being. Make every effort to cut sin out of your life. Cooperate with the sanctifying work of the Spirit. And this begins, brothers and sisters, with confession. Confess your sin to God, but also confess it to one another. Let the secret out, for it is no secret to God. You will find healing when you confess your sin to God and to others. Make every effort to pluck out the eye, to cut off the hand. Take your killing of sin seriously. Be radical with it. Obey your Lord and allow his spirit to work in you so that you might put your sin to death. Confess your bitterness. Confess your lust. Confess your adultery. Confess your pride. Confess your laziness. And maybe some of these passages that we're reading speak of a spiritual drunkenness. But maybe for you, your besetting sin is some sort of physical drunkenness or drug abuse. Use your fear of the Lord to help you understand that you cannot serve two masters. It's either Christ or alcohol. It's either Christ or drugs. Confess your sin. Despise it. Make every effort to kill it. Fear God. Number three. Salt your speech. Again, these are all pulled from 1 Thessalonians 5, so I encourage you to go read that passage and meditate on these things later. But salt your speech. We're each prone to sleep, to begin living as though the return of Christ is not real or imminent. So God, in his kindness, has given us brothers and sisters to remind us of this very reality. That's why you must persist in prioritizing spiritual conversations in the collection of the saints. And don't be satisfied with simply speaking of the mundane, but talk about the glorious things of God when you gather. Paul specifically mentions two ways to do this in the midst of the believers. First, we admonish. Now this is one where we typically like to avoid calling people out for their sin or foolishness. We're afraid of confronting people in their sin because frankly, we're more scared of them than we are of God. So yet, it's clear. It's our obligation to gently and lovingly warn someone of the dangers that their sin or foolishness poses. So within one another, be on the lookout for patterns of sinful speech or activity in your brothers and sisters. And your first step may not be admonishment. It might be a question. A question like, hey, your temper seems to have been short with your family this week. In my interactions with you, you seem to be more short-tempered or quick to anger. What's going on? Or it may be, hey, you seem to be regularly complaining and venting about your situation at school or work. How are you fighting for contentment? See, pointed questions like this can be a springboard into confession. But let's say that confession is not offered even when gentle questions are asked. You may need to progress from there. Reminding your beloved brother or sister that they will face judgment for the words that they say, for the way that they treat others, for their secret habits, for the ways that they represent Christ. So we must salt our speech. We must admonish one another. But not only do we admonish, we encourage we encourage, is there fruit of the Spirit evident in someone's life? Do you see someone gaining victory over sin? Do you see a greater desire for godliness in someone? Brother or sister, point it out when you see it. 
See, real encouragement is not a self-esteem boost. It is an acknowledgement of the work of God for the purpose of spurring someone on. So take a D-group setting, for example. Let's say one of your fellow members in a D-group is coming to that meeting, and time after time, they're showing evidences of godliness. They seem to be fighting their sin well. They seem to be pursuing God in their spiritual disciplines through prayer and Bible reading. But you know what? They may not see it. They may come into that meeting week after week, beat down by their feeble faith. They may be discouraged by their meager attempts to fight sin. They may not see godliness in their own life because they have been blinded by it. They have been discouraged by the world, by their own sin, and by the enemy. It is your obligation then to point out godliness in other people. Brothers and sisters, let us be salting our speech. Let us both admonish and truly encourage one another, reminding each other that God is at work, but that Christ will also return. Number four, make peace. See, living life in a community like this will provide ample opportunity for friction and conflict. So do your part to live at peace with all. And when, not if, when conflict arises, deal with it quickly. If you recognize that you have wronged another, humbly go to them and admit your fault and ask for forgiveness explicitly. Don't say, I'm sorry. Say, I have wronged you. Will you forgive me? And if you have been wronged, gently and humbly go to them and tell them their fault and offer forgiveness. Don't say it's okay. Don't say, oh, don't worry about it. Say, I forgive you. See, we, in the ways that we talk about conflict, about I'm sorry, it's okay, don't worry about it, what we're actually doing is undermining the power of the gospel. Because the gospel doesn't provide just resolution. The gospel provides forgiveness. So in interactions where there is conflict, where there is wrong, give and ask for forgiveness. Number five. Rejoice always. See, the root of all Christian growth is grounded in a, in a greater joy and delight in the gospel. See, the mature Christian is one who recognizes their lack of worthiness for the gospel and God's freely giving of the gospel. So we ought to remind ourselves and others regularly of the hope that is found in Christ and Christ alone. And we ought to take great joy in it, of the blessings afforded to us by our union in Christ. And yes, truly, the promise of his return. I think it's telling that at the end of the book of Revelation, where John is looking forward to the fulfillment of all the things that Jesus has promised, his response is not, Oh dear, his response is, yes, come Lord Jesus, come. See, this is a sign that we rejoice in God, that we beckon him to come, because we rejoice always. Number six, pray constantly. It is not our faithfulness, but God's faithfulness that will see us safely to that day. It is by his power, his gospel, his spirit that we have confidence to face his judgment on that day. And by these realities alone, we ought to recognize our need for Christ on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. So therefore, Paul, in 1 Thessalonians 5, tells his audience to pray without ceasing. Now, this doesn't mean pray 24-7 but rather that prayer is to be a regular and consistent practice for the believer. So cultivate a heart for prayer. And this happens on two fronts. One, you must plan to pray. You must plan to pray. Set, aside a time, set time aside in your day, every day, and commit it to prayer. 
make it a habit, and trust that over time you will find it a joy. And use the scriptures to guide your prayer. Read a psalm and then pray through that psalm. If you want a how-to on how to do this, Don Whitney's got a great book called Praying the Bible. Or you can go ask Taylor Routon or Caleb Shannon who have taught on the subject recently. Sorry, guys, I put you on the spot. I didn't ask you if I was okay to do that, but I feel confident doing it. Go ask them. Say, hey, how do I pray the Bible? And then pray. Make it a regular habit. Make it a part of your regular routine. But not only should you plan to pray, but cultivate a heart of spontaneous prayer. This means that throughout your day, use the prompts in your day as occasions to pray. Pray for the people you encounter. Pray for the tasks you face. Pray for the thoughts on your mind. Does a fellow member come to your mind during the day, seemingly out of nowhere? Pray for them. Does an unbeliever that you know, that you intend to speak with, come to your mind? Pray for them in that moment. It doesn't have to be a long, lengthy prayer, but just cultivate a heart in which you are spontaneously praying for things that are in front of you. So God has scripted our prayers for us. He has given us our word to guide our prayers in intentional time, but he's also given our whole lives as an occasion to pray. So you don't have to come up with ideas on what to pray for. God gives you everything that you need, even to call out to him in prayer. And so, remember that not only do we pray as a sign that we live all of our lives in the face of God, before the face of God, but prayer also reminds us that we live our lives in the caring hands of our Father. So pray constantly. Number seven, give thanks. It's interesting to me that in Romans chapter one, Paul outlines this descending staircase into depravity, into sin and death and destruction. Yet the first step on that staircase is not sexual sin, it's not homosexuality. That first step into this descent into destruction is a lack of thanksgiving. Romans 1.21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. See, Paul says that at the root of sin is a lack of thanksgiving. See, a heart that lacks gratitude toward God is the surest sign of a heart that does not recognize God as Lord and judge. Because it's when we recognize the sheer grace of God on our behalf, then surely our hearts will be filled with thanksgiving. So as you're praying constantly, look for occasions to give thanks to God regularly. Cultivate a heart for thanksgiving. And lastly, number eight, cherish the scriptures. Cherish scripture. See, the scriptures are the means by which God has revealed all of these things to us. The scriptures are what tell us and warn us of the imminent return of Christ. The scriptures are the revelation of God to illuminate our path. So at the time between these two comings of Christ, we know how we ought to walk. See, not only are we on this highway, but it's dark. But God, by his word, illuminates our path for us. That we might see the hazards, the twists, and the turns. God has given us, as Peter tells us, everything necessary for life and godliness godliness through the knowledge of Christ. So devote yourself to God through his word, knowing that this is the surest way to remain awake and ready. The scriptures will remind you of your need to fear God. The scriptures will remind you of your need to fight sin. The scriptures will remind you of your need to salt your speech. The scriptures will remind you of your need to make peace with all. They will remind you of your need to rejoice always, to pray constantly, and to give thanks. In other words, you are never more awake than your, when your attention is on God through the scriptures. So let me close with a word from Peter, who also took Jesus' words seriously. 1 Peter 1.13 Therefore, 
preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, brothers and sisters, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly.